Praise the Lord. What a joy it is to worship our risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I would invite you to turn your Bibles with me to the book of Ephesians. Book of Ephesians. And as you know, obviously, we have, for the past few weeks, past couple months, been going through Mark, the book of Mark. But I wanted to take a break this week and go over to the book of Ephesians and look at something which we began quite a while back, but we actually never finished, and we began doing it on Wednesday nights, that is, going through Ephesians. Uh, that was before we kind of changed the format of Wednesday nights from being a Bible study, more of a, a prayer meeting, and where we would uh, offer a petition, praise, uh, and thanks to our great God as a, as a congregation. Before that, obviously, we, uh, we spent that time uh, looking at the Word of God, and I was teaching through Ephesians 1, and we didn't really finish that out as I desired to do so. And uh, this morning, I would, I would like to do that. I'd like to kind of recap some of what we looked at those, uh, a few weeks ago, a couple of months ago, in fact, and then also to, to finish what we actually never even got to. So I'd like to look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. So a pretty large section here of verses. And what these 14 verses speak to is Trinitarian salvation. Salvation by the Trinity. I spoke about it briefly in Sunday school uh, as we went through the confession there, but I'd like to dig in, uh, in, into more detail. How is it that our salvation has been accomplished? How? It is by the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But before I get into teaching and preaching from this text, let us go to the Lord in prayer and ask Him that He would bless the preaching of the Word. Father, we thank you for the work of our Redeemer, for the work of Jesus Christ, for his death and resurrection. Oh, how we thank you. And for the many blessings that we experience even in our own lives, day by day, we thank you for that. Father, I pray that as the word goes forth, that it would go forth in power, that there would be unction that would be granted to me. I pray that I would preach in a winsome manner, Father, I pray that I would preach with boldness, passion, and fervency. I pray that the hearers would be diligent to hear. I pray that each and every one of us would be changed by the Scriptures. For your glory, Father. May you be glorified and may you be worshipped during this time. For preaching is certainly an act of worship. We pray all these things to you through our mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1, which as I said speaks to the Trinity. We obviously know, brethren, that our salvation has been accomplished by the Lord Jesus Christ through His death and His resurrection. But brethren, let us not forget that Trinitarian salvation is the only salvation. That our salvation we have is a triune work of the Godhead. It is not merely by the Lord Jesus Christ, but by both the Father and the Spirit working with the Son. There is glorious unity in the Trinity bringing about our salvation. But we ask ourselves, what role do each of these specific persons in the Godhead play? What role does the Trinity play in salvation? What does the Father do? What does the Son do? What does the Spirit do? And that is the question. These questions are those questions that I seek to answer. That I seek to to answer it in the preaching of this text. For this text brings forth how our salvation is accomplished by the Father, Son, and Spirit. And there are three things that I want us to see in this chapter here. Firstly, I want us to consider that our salvation is accomplished by the Father in predestining. In predestining. Secondly, our salvation is accomplished by the Son atoning or redeeming. By the Son redeeming. And then thirdly, by the Spirit in His sealing. In His sealing. But before I do, of course, it is fitting to cover the context of this text. To remind you what the context of this passage is. Here in Ephesians 1, Paul is presenting salvation. The glories of salvation to the saints of Ephesus. In fact, my Bible, right above chapter 1, it says the blessings of redemption. That's what my Bible titles this chapter. Blessings of redemption. He's reminding the Ephesians what has happened to them. And it is a glorious salvation. 
He does so also moving right on into chapter 2 as well, reminding the Ephesians how they've been saved. In fact, what does he say in Ephesians 2? He says that you were dead in your trespasses and sins. But then in verse 4 he says, but God being rich in mercy. Verse 5 says, made us alive together with Christ and raised us up with Him. That's verse 6. And seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come He might show the surpassing riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And then in chapter 3, He continues to remind the Ephesians how they have been united in Christ. The first half of the book of Ephesians is theological truth. The abstract, we could say. And then chapter, chapters 4, 5, and 6 is the practical. Paul tells the Ephesians how they are to live. But he begins with the, the great and grand theological truth he wants to make known to the Ephesians by speaking on Trinitarian redemption, Trinitarian salvation. Let us not belittle the glories of salvation by speaking of them as if they are only accomplished by the Lord Jesus Christ or only accomplished by the Father, or even only by the Spirit. It is a trying work. Therefore, let us consider that as we go through these 14 verses. And other verses as well throughout the Scriptures. So let us first consider the Father's work in redemption being that of predestining. The Father's work in redemption, that of predestining. Beginning in verse 1. Paul writes these words. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. Verse, or continue on in verse 1. To the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a very common greeting that Paul gives in most of his letters. In fact, he even uses almost the exact same wording in his other epistles that he wrote. So nothing too unique here in these first two verses. But there's a transition at the end of verse 2 as we move into verse 3. And we find that Paul begins with a doxology. Doxology is something, is an act of worship. It, it, he's worshiping and praising God. He's lifting up praise to the Holy One. In fact, it's interesting, the Greek word for glory is doxa, which is where we get the word doxology from. We are ascribing glory to God. We are giving God the glory. And so he says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the first person in the, in the Trinity. The Father. Certainly not the first one who have existed and then Jesus and the Spirit came into existence later. No, God, each person of the Trinity, has always existed eternally. No beginning, no end. When we say the first person of the Trinity, we are not speaking of the fact that He wants he first came into existence, but that He is the first in order. And we see this example exemplified both in Old and New Testaments, that the Father, when spoken of in Scripture in terms of the Trinity, is usually listed first. So we just mean the order in which they are typically listed in Scripture. We first begin with the Father, then the Son, then the Holy Spirit. And this helps us define our terms when we speak of the triune God. The Father is the first place. He is the first person in this triune Godhead. And who is He the Father of? The Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus has a very unique position. And that is He is the Son. He is the Son. The only begotten Son of God. And as I said earlier this morning in Sunday school, the word begotten is absolutely imperative that we understand it. He has the same essence in nature as a father. He is an equal with the father. For if any of you, my dear brethren, have a son, that child is just as human as you are. They're not less human just because they are your son. You are not more human because you are their father. That child is of the same essence of nature as you. I admit that such an analogy does not do full justice to the Trinity. However, it helps us to understand just in a very small way. That Christ is not less than the Father. He is not subordinate. He is equal in power and glory. 
with the Father. So what is this first person of the Trinity's work in redemption? Well, Paul says in verse 3, Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. The word blessing there in the Greek is eulogia. Eulogia. And it's an invocation of blessing. What's very interesting, that's where we get the word eulogy from. Eulogy. The Father has brought about blessings upon the church. And where are they? In the heavenly places, in Christ. They're sealed in heaven. They're not going to be taken away or removed. And they are in Christ. So as if heaven wasn't secure enough, they're in Jesus, who is our security, who is our surety and our assurance. But these blessings aren't really spoken of in detail in verse 3. He just says blessings. What specifically is Paul referencing? Well, he must read on, for the sentence is not complete. Verse 4 says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So herein is the Father's work in redemption. If those of you who were attending at that time, remember when we were going through on Wednesday nights this passage, I spoke in detail on this. The Father's work in redemption. That is, He chooses from the foundation of the world. Before time came into existence, before the world was made, before the galaxies and the stars had been created, the Father sets us aside. He chose us before the foundation of the world. That we would be holy and blameless before Him. Whose choice is it? It is God's. When we speak of salvation, it is the choice of God. And what is the end to which God chooses us, brethren? What is the purpose of God choosing us in Christ? That we would be holy and blameless before Him. The Father in His great love chose us in Christ. Because we know from verse 3 He says these, these blessings are in Christ. The Father set us aside to one day have salvation in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He chose a specific people for a specific purpose. This, this was not... A, faith, a faceless group of people. They had names. You and me. And it is as it were before the worlds were made, our names were written in the palm of His hand. And He had us prepared for glory. We, brethren, are vessels of mercy that the Father set aside and created to be brought into glory. That's absolutely glorious. That this is something that the triune God has set out to do. This wasn't, it wasn't as if one day we ourselves decided, I'm going to enter into the kingdom. Our salvation began all the way back before Adam and Eve were even created. Before the stars had begun to shine. Before the rains had fallen on the earth. Before any plant had sprouted up. Therein is the triune God in eternity past having set aside a people to save. And why did God do this? At the end of verse 4, two words do we find that ought to be very precious to our hearts. In love. In love. We speak, my friends, oftentimes of the glory of God. Especially I do. When I preach, I talk about God does all things for His glory. But brethren, let us not belittle this fact that God does them for our good. He does them for the benefit of His people because He loves His people. He loves His church with a great love. He says in love, verse 5, He predestined us to adoption. Now again, the word predestined means to decide beforehand. So God, before anything had happened, decided beforehand what was going to happen. And therefore, we have nothing to worry about. Because we know this, that in God's deciding what will happen, He has chosen all things to work for our good and His glory. 
So let that comfort your hearts. As even Brother Joe prayed just a moment ago, God has all things in His hands. And their fates have been decided. Their ends have been set. And that causes the heart of the believer to rejoice. Paul says he, ado- he predestined us to adoption. To adoption, brother. Not just to be holy. Not just to be blameless. To be adopted. To have the right to be children of God. 1 John 3 says, See what great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. We are His own possession. He is our Father. And we are His sons and daughters. Those of us who are in Christ. But if you know not Christ, you are not the child of God, but an enemy of God. And therefore the urgency is greater stress because you must be a child of God to enter God's kingdom. And therefore the call of the gospel is come to the one who will make you a child of God, and that is Christ Jesus the Lord. But the text says he predestined us to adoption as sons. Through Jesus Christ. Again, as I said, come to Christ so that you may be sons and daughters of God. Otherwise, you cannot. Brethren, when we consider salvation as it is accomplished by the Trinity, let us never belittle the centrality of Jesus Christ. If you notice, the work of the Father points to the work of the Son. And the work of the Spirit points to the work of the Son. In the economy of salvation, Jesus takes a center role, a center role in the epic of redemption, in the story of salvation for the people of God. He is the one whom we are commanded and exhorted to look to, to believe in, to turn to, to run to, to rest in, To obey. It is Christ, Christ, Christ. Over and over in scripture. Acts 16.31. Believe in the Lord Jesus. We see in the book of Hebrews. He is our Sabbath rest. We see in John 3. Jesus says. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Even so must the son of man be lifted up. So that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. We are to look to Christ. Going again back to the book of Hebrews. Or we go to Matthew 11. Jesus says, Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We are rest in the Son of God. We are come to the Son of God. So therefore do we find here in verse 5 of Ephesians 1 that in the economy of salvation, Christ takes a center role. Our adoption as the sons and daughters of God comes about because of Christ. And only because of Christ. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself. Brethren, God is jealous for us. God is jealous for us. For us. For His people. Not just for His own glory. Not just for His own praise. But for His own people. He loves His people. In fact, we find in the book of Hosea, God loves His people as a husband does his wife. With jealousy. Holy jealousy. Do you men who are married, do you desire that your wives be with other men? Certainly not. Only a man who has lost his mind. How much more God? How much more God? In fact, we know from here in the book of Ephesians, in Ephesians 5, Jesus' relationship to the church is like a marriage. In fact, we ought to say it the other way. Marriage is like Jesus' relationship to the church. He has a specific, special love for her. And He desires your presence. Think about that, brethren. The God of creation, the God for whom all things have been made, who who commands all things, the end of all things, who even spoke and everything was created, desires our presence, desires 
our communing with Him? That is right. And let us not belittle His great love. According to the kind intention of His will. Brethren, we have been predestined according to the will of God. And that will is a kind will. It's a kind will. Sometimes when believers are dealing with the issues of predestination, this heavy doctrine, and it certainly is a difficult doctrine to grasp and to study and to deal with, but oftentimes what happens with believers when they study this is they forget this reality. That his intention is kind. When a believer tries to grasp God's predestiny, they start to picture God as a robot or a machine, as some arbitrary, lifeless, motionless being. But my friends, God is the living God with a great passion for His people. And in His predestining them to life, it is all out of His great love and with all kind intention. Verse 6, what is the end of this? Verse 6 tells us, to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. Literally translated, that phrase freely bestowed is, He graced us. He graced us with grace. When we speak of a famous person who appears before peasants, we say that, so and so graced them with their presence. Brethren, God has graced us with grace itself. How glorious. In fact, we know from, Ephesians, from John 1, it says, For of His fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. God has given to the believer layer upon layer upon layer, level upon level of grace. We live, breathe, Bathe in, as it were, God's amazing grace. And it is to the praise of the glory of this particular grace that God has done this. So yes, it is for our good. Yes, it is because He loved us. But above that, even it is for His own glory and for His own praise and honor. And it's interesting to find that in this very chapter we find that same phrase two more times. Three times do we find this phrase in Ephesians 1. Look with me. Verse 6. To the praise of the glory of His grace. Go down to verse 12. To the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of His glory. Verse 14. Who has given us a pledge of our inheritance with the view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. Paul wants us to understand something. That the triune God is working for His glory. In fact, we find those three instances of this phrase, to the praise of His glory, here in Ephesians 1, are all at the end of each section of chapter 1. After Paul is done discussing the work of the Father, he says that very phrase. He did it to the praise of His glory. After he discusses this, the work of the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, he, we find in verse 12, he says, Christ has done it all to the praise of His glory. And then after he is done discussing the work of the Spirit, in verse 14 he says, the Spirit has done it to the praise of His glory. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit all have the same motive, the same purpose, and the same goal. And it is to bring glory to the triune God. important we understand the essence of the Trinity, brethren. That we have a biblical doctrine of the Trinity. That we not be confused concerning this subject. And a helpful place to turn to is actually the confession. Our confession, the Lord of Adam's confession. In chapter 2, in verse 3, it says this. In this divine and infinite being, there are three subsistences. The Father, the Word, or Son, and the Holy Spirit. Of what substance, power, and eternity? Each having the whole divine essence. 
And yet the essence undivided. Because what do we see in Deuteronomy 6.5? The Shema. Where Moses tells Israel, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord, He is one. There is one God. There are not many gods. There are not three gods. There is one God. We are monotheists. One. Mono meaning one. Theists meaning, obviously, God. We believe in God. One God. However, we understand that in this God, in this essence nature, there are three persons who possess this full essence of nature. They each fully possess the being of God, yet this being, essence, and nature is in no way divided. I admit that this is a divine mystery, one which will never be fully revealed. But this is not a cause for disbelief, but a cause for awe. Awe. Because we as creatures cannot fully grasp our Creator. In fact, for the rest of my days, what will I do? I'll stand back in awe of the triune God. A God comprehended is no God at all. A God fully comprehended is no God at all. But going back to the text in Ephesians 1. So that's the first section that we just looked at there in universe 6. The Father's role in salvation is predestined. Secondly, let us consider the Son's work in redemption. And that is uh, atoning or redeeming. Verse 7 begins, In Him we have redemption through His blood. So the Son's specific role in salvation is to come down, to become a man, as we talked about last week. He takes upon Himself human nature and bears the sin of the people of God and spills His blood for them. For that particular people whom the Father chose. So we see continuity here. The Father chooses into the Son, dies for them. As I've spoken on before, the Father in eternity past covenants with the Son concerning our souls. We have from John 10, Jesus said of the church, the Father gave us to Him. And therefore, Jesus agreed to die for us and therefore would be rewarded. He would be rewarded for having died for us. And Christ agreed to this covenant agreement between the members of the Trinity. This is called the covenant of redemption. And even the Holy Spirit agreed as well, joined in in this covenant, agreed to equip Jesus to do what he did, and then to apply his work to us. So Christ comes and suffers and dies for the church. He spills His blood. We are saved by the blood of Christ. Romans 5, 9. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. The, it says the forgiveness of our trespasses. Every last one of the sins which we have committed is washed away because of the cleansing power of the blood of the Lamb of God. Now I want to clear up some confusion here. Oftentimes when people speak of the blood, especially in Pentecostal circles, they use the term the blood a lot. Brethren, the blood, that when it's spoken of in Scripture, it's not that we're actually saved by the substance, as if somehow it touches our soul and we're cleansed. Certainly not. Or it's certainly not as if, as the Catholics teach, that the wine becomes the blood of Jesus during the Mass. No. When the Scripture speaks of our being saved by the blood of Christ, it is that Christ's life was demanded of Him rather than our own. Because we find in the Old Testament, it says the life of the creature is in His blood. If you don't have your blood, you're dead. Obviously. When Christ spilled His blood, it was symbolic. It meant something. And that was that His life, instead of yours and mine, brethren, was required of Him. 
And therefore we are saved by the blood of Christ. We are saved by Christ having been cursed for us. Galatians 3 clearly tells us that Jesus Christ became a curse for us. And he did it in, in agreement with the Father's predestiny. The Father's election. It's interesting. The members of the Trinity are never in disagreement. They are never at odds with one another. Christ died for that specific group that the Father set aside. He did not die for all men exclusively. He died for a specific group because of His love for them. If Christ died for every man, even those who are in hell right now, a couple things would be true. One, God would be punishing the same sin twice. He would be damning those on whose behalf Christ had already been damned. And also, it would put the members of the Trinity at odds with one another. For why would the Father set aside a people to save, and then the Son to come and die for every person exclusively, or inclusively, every single human being? And many people, though, will still stand and say, no, Jesus did die for every single person. However, such people even then agree in what is commonly called a limited atonement. For you simply ask him, did Christ die for the demons? Did Christ die for Satan? No. Well, they believe in a limited atonement. Scripture just goes further than that and says, Christ's atonement was a, for a specific purpose, for a specific people. What we just read this morning in John 17, when he prayed in the garden, who was he praying for? Was he praying for the world? No. He says, no, I'm not praying for the world. Who was he praying for? Those whom the Father gave him. What does he say in John 10? I lay my life down for the sheep. And then the unbelieving Jews there in John 10 were angry at Christ. And he said, you are not my sheep. Pretty incredible. So brethren, let us realize that the members of the Trinity are in agreement. There is unity. The Father sets them apart and the Son dies for them. Exclusively. And why is this? Verse 7, according to the riches of His grace. More grace. He, it was not enough for Paul just to say it was grace. He had to say he is rich in grace. There are riches of grace that we have in Christ. And they come from God who is rich in grace. Verse 8. Which He lavished on us. Lavish. That's a strong term, brethren. Christ Jesus has purchased for us a lavishing of grace. In all wisdom and insight, verse 9, He made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His kind intention, which He purposed in Him, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is the summing up of all things in Christ, Things in the heavens and things on the earth. In Him also we have obtained an inheritance. Having been predestined, there is that word again, according to His purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His will. That word there, work, excuse me, works, is derived from the Greek word energeo, which is where we get the word energy. God is powerfully, effectually working all things after the counsel of His will. So take heart, my brothers and sisters. The world is not chaotic in the sense that it has just a random end. There's a purpose. A divine purpose. And God is working all things after the counsel of His most holy will. But then verse 12, listen to this. To the 
in that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be the, to the praise of His glory. So what is the end of Christ's work? The glory of God. It's incredible. The members of the Trinity are united. In fact, they're oftentimes spoken of in Scripture, all together in, in just a few verses. Uh, Jesus said the Great Commission, Matthew 28. What are we to do? Baptize all men in the name of the Father, Son, Spirit. Unity. Paul, the end of 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. I'll turn there, actually. He says this. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Unified. There's unity. Therefore, Paul could say that. In fact, even in creation, the Spirit, the Spirit, Son, and Father are all in unity. For what we find in Genesis 1.26, God says, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Our? Us? There is triunity. Even the Hebrew name for God, Elohim, <coughs> the generic name for God is plural. Elohim. And that is very telling indeed. So going back to verse 12, Christ's work is for the glory of God, just as the Father's work is for the glory of God. Lastly, let us consider in verses 13 and 14, the work of the Spirit, which is sealing. The work of the Spirit, which is sealing. Verse 13. In Him, you also, after listening to the message of truth. So he says, you believers that I'm writing to, you listen to the message of truth. What is that? The good news of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, that Jesus died and was buried and was raised again on the third day. In fact, theologians call this the outward call of the gospel. Brethren, whatever I preach here in the pulpit or on the streets, or if you hand a gospel tract to someone, or share the gospel through conversation, that is what is called the outward call of the gospel. And that is the call that we are commanded to give to every person in the world. Every man, woman, and child, we are commanded to give them the outward call of the gospel. To tell them that Jesus died and was buried and was raised on the third day. But you say, God has only selected the elect, and Christ has only died for the elect. My friend, we are commanded to give it to all, for we do not know who the elect are. God did not cause them to be born with a stripe on the back of their neck. We don't know who the elect are, so we are to preach to all creation. And Scripture commands us to. Jesus says in Matthew 28, we go back to that text, make disciples of all nations. So we are to give this outward call of the gospel. And that's what Paul references here, because he says, after listening to the message of truth, this implies that they heard it through some way. Perhaps reading it, perhaps hearing it preached, we're not sure exactly how they were reached with the gospel, but they had the outward call brought to them. And this is the only way they'll be saved. People are going to be saved by the outward call of the gospel. So it's imperative we bring it. It's imperative we send out missionaries into the world, because what does Scripture say? God has people from around the world whom He's going to save. From every tribe, tongue, nation, and people... Therefore, we are to go. It's urgent. We are to go. So he says, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. This is where we find the second thing I would like to point out, and that is the inward call of the Holy Spirit. There is the outward call of the gospel. Again, as I said, that is brought to every person. And then there is the inward call. That is the call that the Spirit of God brings to the heart of the elect. So that people that the Father chose, set aside from the foundation of the world, that people that Christ died for out of His great love, now the Spirit comes down and comes into those people and gives them the inward call. Gives them the ability to believe the gospel. Gives them the ability to repent and, and trust in Christ. For repentance and faith are not things that we muster up. They're not things that we can exercise. 
Repentance and faith are gifts from God. In fact, 2 Timothy chapter 2 says this. Verse 25, it says, With gentleness correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of truth. Where does repentance come from? God's granting it to the sinner. And that's what the Spirit does. That's the inward call of the Gospel. The Spirit moves someone inwardly, raises in the spiritual life, gives him the abil ability to turn from sin, and the ability to believe the Gospel. Faith as well is a gift from God. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God. Where does faith come from? God, who gives it as a gift. Let us not think of repentance and faith as things which men can muster up in themselves. If so, salvation would be 90% of man, or 90% of God, 2% of man. Or 99% of God, 1% of man. But no, repentance and faith, the entirety of salvation is by the trying God. That is true grace. So we have the outward call and the inward call of the Holy Spirit of God. And then he says you were sealed. The Spirit of God does not grant repentance and faith for a season. God does not give eternal life for a moment. It's not eternal life. What did Jesus say in John 10? I give them eternal life. It is a foolish doctrine. That doctrine which teaches that you can lose your salvation. People say, but if you teach such a doctrine, you will give people a license to sin and to do whatever they want. Absolutely not. For if they know and understand that they have been truly saved, they will not do whatever they want. They will do whatever God wants. They will live however He says. Because He has given them such a great gift. Verse 14, the Spirit of God is given, it says, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance. That is a down payment that God is going to give us something. And it's an inheritance in glory. Brethren, the Spirit in us right now is a slice of glory, as it were. It's a foreshadowing. It's a foretaste of glory divine. It's a foretaste of what we're going to receive in heaven. So lift up your faces, brethren. Be excited for glory. Look forward to that which is soon to take place. With a view to the redemption of God's own possession. So we go, it takes us all the way back to the beginning. God's own possession. The Father predestines, the Son atones, the Spirit applies. And what is the end? What is the purpose? To the praise of His glory. The Father does it for His glory. The Son does it for His glory. And the Spirit does it for His glory. It's all for the glory of God, brethren. So let us be wise and realize that if God is operating to bring His name glory, let us also operate, work, labor, Sweat, bleed if it, if it demands it for the glory of God. That is the end of man. The Baptist, Confe uh, the Baptist Catechism, question two says, what, uh, the question is, what is the chief end of man? The answer is man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. We are made for that purpose. So let us live for that purpose. Brethren, let your hearts be encouraged by these truths and realities that are found here in Ephesians 1. And realize that our salvation has been accomplished by the Trinity, the triune God, by His own might and power. But do not sit idle. Do not sit around. But let us go and bring this outward call to the world. For God has a people. God has a people to Himself. We may not know who they are. 
But we will one day. Let us be diligent to publish the gospel, to spread the gospel wherever we go in this life. You who are lost are called to embrace Christ by the power of the Spirit for the glory of God. You are called to put your trust in the Trinity. If you know not Christ, you are called, commanded, and exhorted even pled with to believe upon the triune God who brings about salvation for His glory. And specifically, the second person of the Trinity, who, as I said, is the focus of the Gospel, you are to believe that He died and was buried and was raised on the third day. You who say you know Christ, you're called to examine yourselves to see whether this triune God has done a work in you. And if so, glory to God Praise be to God that God has changed you and you know it by the way you live. But if you're a hypocrite, the call is the same and it is to repent and believe the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be diligent, brethren. Our faith is not merely, it is not merely to affect our emotion, and to affect even the will, but also the intellect. We are to know our God. So let us study these, these deep truths out. Let us go and give ourselves to the study of the Word, to the meditation upon the Word, that we might digest spiritual truth by God's grace. So we have seen here in Ephesians chapter 1, Verses 1 through 14. Salvation is accomplished by the Father in His predestined, by the Son in His redeeming, and by the Spirit in His sealing. All in unity, all as one God, not divided, not three gods, one God, three eternal persons. And for the purpose of the good of His people, and for His own glory and praise and honor. And this God in His holiness has given His law, which we broke. His Ten Commands, which you know that you've broken. And therefore we deserve hell. But when the fullness of the times came, Christ Jesus fulfilled the law, died a sinner's death, in the room instead of sinners, bore the wrath of the Father and was raised on the third day. And all who look to the Son of God, all who believe upon Christ, have life eternal. Because of His power. They have their sins forgiven and they are credited with the righteousness of Christ. All by grace. All by grace. Those repentance and faith are not things we do, but God, things God does in us. And those who are saved, their lives are changed. They are new creations. Because God has raised into spiritual life. It is all by grace, brethren. All by grace. I cannot stress it enough. Grace, grace, grace. That is the purpose. To bring praise to the glory of God's grace. So therefore, to God be all glory, both now and to the day of eternity. The triune God, He is worthy of all glory. Indeed, to Him be glory. Let's go to the Lord in a prayer. O oh, blessed triune God, O oh, blessed Godhead, we stand in awe of Thy glory and Thy power. We pray that the Word of God would have its intended effect. And we ascribe unto Thee all glory praise, and honor. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. And O oh, blessed triune God, how we praise You for Your grace. 
And we ascribe to you glory. Both right now and hopefully for the rest of our lives, may we give you glory forever and ever. Amen.